Holding. Holding. You guys have thought back to this one. Okay. All right, Greg, so we'll start easy first. What's your name? My name is Greg Brooks. And who are you? I am the uh, owner and uh, chief operating officer of Subsea Research. And what is Subsea Research? Subsea Research is a research and salvage company on uh, historic shipwrecks. And where have you been with Subsea Research? Is it only the Port Nicholson, or have you been other? No, we started out off of uh, Charleston, South Carolina, went to the Bahamas, back up. I did say. Where have I been looking for shipwrecks and researching shipwrecks? Well, first we started out off of Charleston, South Carolina on a pirate ship. We went to uh, uh, the Bahamas, and we found another pirate ship with some coins and stuff on it. Then we went down to Florida and worked with Mel Fisher for a while uh, on the Atocha site, the area out there. Then we went to Haiti. And what was Haiti? Haiti was, oh, it was quite an interesting place. I mean, uh, the government is a very corrupt government, but we did get a, manage to get a contract with them. We found several, we'll say, very uh, valuable shipwrecks, but the country is so corrupt, it's, uh, we knew that if we had pulled them up, they would have taken it away from us, and uh, uh, we wouldn't have got anything. So we just basically did a lot of research, surveying, finding shipwrecks and things like that, and try to identify them. So it seems like, Jimmy, it was kind of deeply that your experience with Haiti was your first experience, like, against a government or working with a government. Did, you, did that surprise you, or did you go in there knowing that the government was corrupt and that they may take your route? Now, when we got to Haiti, you know, I, I was very enthusiastic because I had been there before a long time ago, and we found a 70-pound bar of silver. So uh, I knew that the only way to recover that bar of silver was to get a contract with the government. And uh, so when I got down there, uh, I assumed that they were, you know, we'll say semi-civilized and that we could get this contract, but it turned out that uh, uh, it wasn't that way. And they have a saying in Haiti, behind every mountain is another mountain. And uh, it's so true because uh, you'd go to see one person and they, you'd have to kind of, you know, get a, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a license have you, uh, whatever have you, cut that out, but <laughs> I couldn't think of a term. But anyways, you'd have to pay one official, then you'd go to another official and get permission from him, and it went on and on and on, and it would never stop. So I just decided I wouldn't do it that way. Uh, you know, I was going to benefit their country with pulling up these things, so I decided I'd wait till I met with the right people to get the job done the right way. And you just went and did it on your own? Yes. We went, well, what we did is we basically went down there, we researched a lot of shipwrecks, found a lot of them, tried to uh, identify them to see if there was anything worthwhile of uh, salvaging or historical or things like that. And uh, I gave all that data to the government, uh, even though it was kind of, you know, at the time it was very comprehensive and they really didn't understand the surveying that we did. Uh, but I gave it to the government. We just didn't give them locations of the wrecks that we found. And you, they didn't help at all? No, they ju they put people on board and they hindered us as, at every turn. It, the end result, did you find something? Or? Yes, we, uh, we found a, uh, a, a place there that had like several shipwrecks. And uh, we found uh, what we think was a uh, stern castle of a, a treasure ship. And because it's a big coral encrustation, and it had swords with uh, jewels in the handle. Uh, we found coins, stacks of coins embedded in the coral, so we know it's a very rich wreck. And uh, we really wanted to work on that site, but the government was just uh, not having any of it. So it's still sitting there waiting for us to return someday. Oh, it's still there? Yes. Oh, wow. So in retrospect, it Bad learn or a learning experience. I guess. Oh, it was definitely a learning experience and not always a good one. I did love the people of Haiti because uh, every time we went down, we would bring down lumber, uh, food supplies, because it's one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. It's considered a fourth world country, and meaning that there's no hope of economic recovery. And so we'd bring down a lot of food supplies and things like that. We helped a uh, pastor down there build his house and his church. Uh, we built a dock for them so that they could, uh, the people could not have to wade out to their boats to get into the little dugouts to go to the main island. 
Uh, so we helped as much as we could because I like the Haitian people. So you bring all this to them. You think they would at least let you do your own thing and find a, a rep there? Like you're helping them. You would assume, but that's not how real life is. The people loved us there. They really did. It's like any government uh, bureaucracy. And if you could just sum up that overall experience, how would you describe it? Frustrating. Uh, the experience in Haiti was the most frustrating thing I think I've ever dealt with, uh, besides a couple of the latest ones. But uh, at the time, it was very frustrating to try to get things done because we knew that where the stuff was, but we couldn't recover it. But it must have been a good feeling to help people, though. Along the way. Oh, definitely. It was, uh, we helped them uh, in feeding them, clothing them, building shelters and things like that. So that made us all feel good to do that because we had so much more than they did. Cool. All right. Back on track now. What makes you want to make another documentary? What makes me want to make another documentary? Well, the, the thing of it is, is uh, the story of the Port Nicholson is out there out in the, in the general public, and it's not a good story because it's all one-sided. Uh, the press took the story and turned it all around uh, and put up, basically told lies. They printed them, and uh, we want to put the proof out there of what really happened, how the Port Nicholson was even, how it even came up, why we believe that it's a, there's a valuable cargo aboard, and to set the story straight, because it's our story, not their story. They they just taken they're taking bits and pieces of it from people that know nothing about it, and they're actually printing it. And uh, a lot of people have the bad a bad idea of what's been happening. So we want to set the record straight, show our evidence, show why we believe that it's on there, and uh, uh, we'd still we want to go back out there and get it someday. One interesting thing you brought up is it's not the real story. That so it's kind of like there's two stories going on, like the real story and the story of what they created. Can you tell me what the real story is of the Port Nicholson? The real story of the Port Nicholson is, uh, this is the long one. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. The real story of the Port Nicholson was back in 2005, a gentleman from Australia contacted me. His name was uh, Terry Kelly. Well, Mr. Kelly contacted me, and uh, we, he started discussing these World War I and World War II bullion ships that were carrying tons of gold, jewels, and that type of thing. And I had never even heard of that. But then when uh, uh, you, he explained it to me, well, during World War II especially, Germany was overtaking all of Europe, and the people... The people uh, uh, had to get rid of their securities and their gold and things because otherwise the German army would have taken it when they invaded their countries. And they knew that. So they had to get this gold and this, these valuables out of the country. Well, they put them on, at first they put them on military vessels because they were the safest ones. But as the Germans came forward, we'll say faster, they started uh, expanding across Europe faster than anybody anticipated. They started putting it on passenger liners, freighters, and things like that to get that, the bullion out of the country. And it was, it was news to me because I had never looked into it, never studied it, or anything like that. So Mr. Uh, Kelly told me all about this stuff. And so I said, all right, well, let me think, of, think on it for a while. Well, after he hung up, I started doing some research into Mr. Kelly to make sure that he was, you know, a legitimate guy. And he's uh, registered with the uh, Australian uh, Archaeological Society and Historical Society he, in good standing. He's done a few projects of his own, recovering uh, uh, World War I airplanes and things like that. So he's a, he was a legitimate person. And it interested me enough to invite him to come from Australia up here to uh, Maine, and he did. Uh, in 2006, he came up here and spent like 10 days or so. Uh, for the first few days, we sat around discussing all of this. Uh, my wife, uh, my partner, John Hardy, and his wife went out to dinner, and he was, uh, Mr. Kelly was very enthusiastic about uh, these World War I and World War II bullion wrecks. And what he explained to us is he had a handwritten ledger that had all the World War I and World War II bullion wrecks that, uh, well, shipwrecks that were sunk. There was a lot of them that made it, but then uh, there was quite a few of them that sunk, actually 700 and something of them in both wars. 
And uh, this handwritten ledger came from a guy that worked at the Bank of England in the archival department, and he had handwritten these in a ledger. And Mr. Kelly had that ledger. Uh, he wouldn't show it to us per se. He, I mean, he, he referenced it. We knew he had it there, but he didn't want us to see inside of it. And I don't blame him because it was a very valuable ledger. Well, after a couple of days, my partner John and I, we decided he was telling us the truth. It was a viable thing. Well, Mr. Kelly wanted to jump on our boat and head out to sea and, and start recovering this treasure because he told us about the, one of the richest wrecks is within 100 miles of where you are right now. Well, you know, you draw a 100-mile radius around Portland, and it goes down to, let's say, off of Nantucket and up north. Northern Maine. Well, he went back, oh, before that, then I uh, hooked him up with my researcher out of Massachusetts because my researcher was supposedly very well versed in World War II ships, uh, war supplies, shipwrecks, things of that nature. He, he's got a huge library on it. So I put him together with uh, Terry Kelly uh, to, let's say, kind of dig up some, as much as he could, uh, to help us in making a decision whether to work with the guy or do a contract. Well, he spent a few days down in Massachusetts with our researcher, came back here, and uh, I was excited about it because, to me, everything he told me was sounded uh, on the up and up because I had listened in the past to many, many people that, you know, fly by night as nut jobs and things like that telling us they found a cannon, so there's got to be a, a Spanish galleon somewhere. Or they found an anchor, you know, and there's treasure somewhere out there, you know. But uh, so those those are just things that happen when in this business. Well, Mr. Kelly went back to Australia. Now he still didn't give us the name of the ship that uh, uh, this cargo was on within a hundred miles. So I started doing our own research, me and the researcher, and uh, basically what we did is we looked at. What ships sunk in this 100-mile radius of Portland? Uh, it, it would have to be something substantial to carry a lot of uh, valuable cargo. And the, there was only one, and that was the Port Nicholson, because that was torpedoed with another ship uh, called the uh, Cherokee, which was a, an American troop transport. They were both sunk off of uh, uh, 50 miles off of Cape Cod, and... Uh, they had five escort ships surrounding the convoy, so it was very, very unusual the way it was sunk. And so that, that gave me enough information, enough knowledge, and enough excitement to go look for it and see if we could find it. So we spent two years searching the ocean for the wreck uh, because the U.S. Navy, uh, the Canadian uh, Navy, the escort ships that surrounded these two vessels uh, place the location in one spot. Now, you would think that the naval vessels and everybody else would say, okay, these things were sunk right here, so they would know where they were. So they placed a mark on the chart that said this is where it sank. Well, you know, 40 years later, whatever, uh, no, it's for more than that, but I have to cut that part too, good God. Anyways, uh, you would think that they, they would know where the vessels were sunk. And so we took the location that they had, that's where our starting point. We spent two years from that point searching the ocean. We expanded our grid. We went back, uh, did more research. We found where they picked up bodies that were uh, from the uh, Cherokee and from the Port Nicholson that were floating, that they, were, uh, they found them out there. So we plotted those with the uh, recovery marks on the chart. We went back in uh, history and the weather uh, stations and uh, found out if there was any storms, which way the wind was blowing, and we tried to c coordinate where these the ship could have went down. We searched and we searched. We searched, and uh, on the, the second year, I was ready to give up because we had covered such a large area out there. The ocean's a big place, and uh, we'll say a week or so before I was ready to pull the plug on it, uh, the boat, uh, uh, Sun Worshipper, which was our survey boat, found a wreck, and it fit the profile of the Port Nicholson. And uh, we matched it up with the, prim the drawings that we had, which weren't the best drawings in the world, but it gave the length, the width, and the basic uh, layout of the ship. 
and uh, the side scan sonar went across the ship and gave us a sonar return of a vessel almost identical to the one uh, to the Port Nicholson. So it did take another few years before we uh, identified it 100%, but uh, we were pretty sure that's what it was. But to verify it, we had to find the Cherokee because that sank along with the Port Nicholson, and it was only like a mile away. So we, we did some more surveying, and we found the Cherokee. So we knew that it, those were the two vessels. Now it was to find out what the Port Nicholson had aboard. So the Cherokee verifies the Port Nicholson. That what what was the thing that what makes the Cherokee what put the Cherokee there? That's well, because there was two ships, two ships that were torpedoed, the Port Nicholson and the Cherokee, and they both sank, and they both sank in this pretty much the same location. So that told us that if if we found one, and we wanted to verify that it was the Port Nicholson, then we'd have to find the Cherokee because that sunk right right close to it, and if we didn't find that, then it would have been a different ship, not the Port Nicholson. Okay. So we found both of them, and uh, we verified that uh, one was a troop transport and one was a British freighter. And did Mr. Kelly's involvement end once he, gave, he met you, or does he still, was he still part of it? No, what happened was when he went back, uh, Australia is a long ways from here, and uh, when he went back, uh, he got into some other things, and he was trying to get some more people involved in bullion wrecks around the world. And he posted on TreasureNet Forum uh, uh, that he was not looking for anybody else to go looking for their shipwrecks, that he made a deal with us. It was a verbal agreement that says he would uh, work only with subsea research from Portland, Maine. And that is a ver verifiable thing. So that's where this all started was, was Mr. Kelly. Uh, of course, we dug up our own uh, data thereafter because he didn't tell us it was the Port Nicholson. He said it was a freighter uh, that was carrying tons of platinum and diamonds and some gold. Uh, so what we had to do is, like I said, we had to find a, a shipwreck that sh was sunk under, we'll say, extreme or, or not un under abnormal circumstances. And... The Port Nicholson and the Cherokee had five escort ships. Coming from Halifax to Boston run was considered one of the safest runs in the, in the whole United States or the whole world. So they out normally would only have one, and most of the time they had n none following the convoys because they considered it a very safe route. Well, this time they had five escort ships. Now, why do you suppose that would be? We throw that out there just because. Yeah. All right. Um, some more things I noted is your researcher. Well, what's your history with him? How did you? I, well, him? what would I'm not going to do is mention names because okay. it's it's not a good idea because it opens up for liability. So what I'm going to do is just say a researcher from Massachusetts. Anybody that knows already knows it, but I'm not mentioning names. But you trust. Me. I, my, our researcher that we had uh, actually was had done a lot of research for us in the past, and I had I trusted him a hundred percent. He actually gave me information while we was in Haiti about uh, a, a couple of British uh, frigates that went down on the south coast of Haiti, and with his information we located him. So I had no re no reason to doubt him whatsoever. All his research seemed to me to be pretty authentic. And you even research yourself, you mentioned. Yeah, we, we did a lot of research with other people. It's like with the Port Nicholson. We didn't depend totally on our research out of Massachusetts. We had another a guy out of, uh, uh, down in uh, Cape Cod, uh, Rick Weckler. No, I can't use names. He, well, he's passed away anyway, so. Uh, Rick Weckler, he, he was writing a book on the Cherokee. And, of course, he, he came across a lot of stuff from the Port Nicholson. He got the war, some war records that we didn't have. Uh, we also used a researcher up in Canada. Uh, she came up with some things that the Canadian government had, and uh, the Canadian government still has a ton of it under, under seal. It's, it's still top secret on that convoy, and we can't access it. And uh, uh, so we had more than just our researcher in Massachusetts. Uh, we wanted to dig up as much as we could. 
and uh, try to uh, find out what exactly was the cargo. Was it one bar of gold, 50 tons, what? We had an idea what it was, We, you know, around 30 to 50 tons of it, but, you know, we wanted to verify it 100%. Okay. Um, and then you noted that the naval vessels knew where the ship was. What... Why did they never go go and get it if they could pinpoint this ship in an area? Well, <laughs> governments don't, aren't known to make money. Governments are known to uh, waste money. <laughs> and uh, the Navy wasn't set up. At, it, back in 1942, uh, diving in 700 feet of water was not something that they did at that time. Uh, that came later. So uh, it, it was, the technology wasn't available to go to that depth. So uh, they, they uh, marked it wrong on the chart, whether they have the right uh, location or not, I don't know. But they marked it on the chart, and that was from the Canadian government, the U.S. government, and the uh, owners of the ship, which was the port line. Uh, they all placed the sinking in this one location right within a small area. And like I said, well, we found it 15 to 20 miles from that location. Very interesting. Why would you? Uh, if 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 it was, well, I don't know. That that's speculation, but it would have to be something valuable or top secret on the vessel, so that nobody would go out there and locate it, and recover what, whatever was on it. Because uh, later on, and I think we're jumping ahead here, but uh, another thing that we found was a loop cable around the wreck. Now, what a loop cable is is they used to put them across harbors and stuff so that if a submarine, an enemy submarine or an enemy ship crossed crossed it, it would let the people on shore know that somebody unauthorized had just come into the harbor without, you know, uh, that wasn't supposed to. Now, uh, while we were out there working, uh, a few years after we actually did start working, we uh, lost some equipment, so we were dragging for it, trying to grapple some uh, cable and stuff like that that we had lost. We wanted to get it. Well, we dragged up some smaller cable and uh, from around the ship, and we didn't know what it was because I, we had never seen it. We knew it was from the early years. Uh, we thought maybe it was something that they were carrying on the ship. Well, it was, it was kind of uh, away from the ship, so it wasn't on the ship. And when we, uh, one of my crew members, Alex, uh, he knew somebody that did a lot of research into these old ships. They, you know, they were they did a, uh, you know, cargoes and things like that. So he actually took a piece of this cable that we brought up, brought it to him, and he said, "This is a loop cable," and he said, "Somebody put placed a loop around the Port Nicholson," and we're going like, "That wouldn't. Why would somebody do that? Why would somebody put a a, ca a loop cable around the Port Nicholson?" Only one reason is they would know if somebody went entered that area. And being 50 miles off of Cape Cod, I mean, that, that was an expensive process to do back in the 1940s. But they did it. Now, you know, we, we've never come across any record of anyone doing it, but the cable speaks for itself. It's out there. It was around the Port Nicholson. So why would they do that? You know, there's so many of those kinds of things, like why did they do all of these things? Correct. <laughs> I'm supposed to say that. I, I don't know if they collaborated, whether the, the, the uh, Canadian government, the uh, uh, U.S. government and things uh, uh, did it on purpose, marked the wrong location. Uh, they were all, you know, all overtired that night and they all placed it somewhere else. What we do know is when the convoy left Halifax, it was going on a straight run. And they didn't. They weren't going with lights out, which they should have been. Uh, they should have been zigzagging too, which they normally do. But they they weren't doing that that night. And uh, uh, they picked up uh, some kind of sound. They thought they heard a submarine. So one of the escort vessels started slowing down, and they encountered a German U-boat. And while he was there trying to find them, dropping depth charges on them, the convoy proceeded heading in. Supposedly they were going to New York. But they got orders to pull into Boston uh, on the trip. So, but they were they were proceeding, and this one ship stayed behind to try to shoot get rid of this submarine. Well, 
Then the convoy, a few hours later, the convoy called back to this uh, ship that was engaging with this U-boat and said, forget them, come, come, come back with us. So he left because he couldn't find it again, find the U-boat. Went back, and just before he joined the convoy, another U-boat fired two torpedoes at the uh, Cherokee, which she sunk within minutes. She just went right down. Then fired two more torpedoes at the Port Nicholson. Now, uh, you're going to be a pretty brave captain to come up there. There's five escort ships surrounding this, you know, the Port Nicholson and the, the Cherokee and go in there so that you can fire four torpedoes. Now, with all these warships around them. So, what, did they know that there was something on board? Were they waiting for them? We don't know that, but... Uh, there's, there's a possibility that they knew that there was a valuable cargo, whether it was gold, whatever it may be, that was on the Port Nicholson. The German U-boats were sitting there waiting for them to arrive. And, can I just ask one more question real quick? And where does that information come from? Oh, that's, that came from the, uh, I mean, from the uh, Canadian government's archives uh, and from our... our uh, U.S. naval logs that are uh, wait a minute, that have been released in, uh, by Freedom of Information Act. Okay. We did get copies of the uh, inquests uh, because they had a lot of inquests because there was a lot of people that died on the Cherokee and on the Port Nicholson, so they had inquests. And we have copies of the questions and answers and 